Wake up! I'm Doug and this is the Tasting Sensibility Channel. And today we're at coffee review number 19 where we're looking at this fine specialty coffee from India. But before we get into that, I need to pour some and get it cool enough because I taste it so much better at lower temperatures, not at tongue burning temperatures. And I usually show you on a map where it's from. And this will take a couple maps. Because my usual source, Coffee Obsession, a wonderful book by Annette Maldver, does not really show precisely where this comes from in India. So there's a nice section on India that I went over last time. And the coffee growing region is a, a newer one. Historically, it usually just grows Arabica, but uh, the spot this is from, Araku Valley, or Araku Valley, I don't know, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing almost everything, is kind of in between those spots. So it's not hard for me to find. Uh, Google Maps, so here's a place called Andhra Pradesh. This is the whole Indian subcontinent, and I cut off the point down here. Andhra Pradesh, and up here is Odisha. And this place, Araku Valley, is kind of in right in between them. So the two spots located on the map are surrounding the origin locale of this coffee today. So this is from uh, Lens Coffee. And I'll put a link down below so you can take a look at the website. So I guess another thing before I get tasting is that I'll remind you to like and subscribe. If you liked all the things that you're seeing here on this channel, whether it's coffee or black licorice or honey or any number of other things, please give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment or question. I've been having a good time interacting with you all who have questions or comments about things. And subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to get notified when the new videos come out on Mondays. So, what's in this cup? Ooh, it smells deep, dark, rich. You can tell it's roasted. But it feels a little warm to be drinking it yet. Wow, rich. Wow, it's not all that sweet. All the notes are lower notes. There's no flowery things. There's not really any fruity things. Earthy, cocoa. It doesn't exactly taste like chocolate yet, but the tendency is usually to taste more like, co like cocoa as it cools off. And I'm getting that sort of thing. Definitely an earthiness. Wow, it's rich and it, wow, all the notes are unfamiliar, except the earthiness. There's a faint and vegetal component that's not unpleasant, it's not bitter. It's just not one that I'm used to. So I bought this a few weeks ago from Lens Coffee. This is a three pound bag of unroasted beans. And they say this works at lots of different roast levels, light on through to darker. And I guess I got about what I wanted when I roasted these, but this is the only roast I've done. I only tasted this a couple times. And I remember it being complex and interesting and way different than all the other things I've had from Africa, Central and South America. And it's still different. I like it. It's rich, medium body, robust flavor. Which is uh, fitting, I guess, because it's a specialty Robusta. That coffee growing region that was in the book on that eastern coast 
along the eastern coast of India there is known for Arabica. And Robusta is grown in other parts of India, but this is grown up in the mountains and it's very interesting, very good. So, I am liking this and it's going away fast. It just has a different mix of flavors in the other coffees I've had. So I recognize the earthiness. It is turning into a bit of a cocoa note. And if I had to pick out anything else that was food-like, I might say there's dark fruits or dried fruits, like a vague raisiny character, prune, plum, date, fig sort of thing without a lot of fruit sweetness. Sometimes those appear in things with, with and without sweetness, and this time it's without. Hmm. Wow. And it went fast. So I'm definitely liking it. So let's see what else I can pull out of here. This is just fascinating. I could tell it was a dark, darker roast, darker body, dark, you know, fuller, more robust body. Just from the smell and all that stuff came through on the, on the palate. Yeah, it's filling out with a creaminess or a caramely nature, and but it's not, it, again, it's not sweet. Some mouth coating aspect to it. It's a little different because it's made in the same automatic drip maker that I use all the time. It's going through a paper filter. It doesn't usually cause those rich, oily mouthfeel episodes, but this one is a little fuller and creamier. Very full, rich mouthfeel. And the flavors are just interesting. Devoid of fruitiness, devoid of sweetness. But there's nothing burnt or harsh. Wow, maybe the dark fruits is all I can pull out that might be related to food otherwise. The earthiness is there. It is turning into a bit of a cocoa, dark chocolate type thing. With just a hint of the bitterness of the cocoa. So this is really different and I was expecting it to be and it, it's tasted the same way both times I've had it. Interesting and complex, so definitely a good specialty coffee. I have enough here to do some cream. Now well, let's let's do the whole thing. smell. It's definitely heading the buttery and butterscotch direction. Wow, it is nice, creamy, buttery. But the, the cocoa notes and earthiness, they don't turn into a chocolate milk like thing like I usually get. So it's rich and creamy. With a distinct lack of a chocolate milk note that I usually get. So this is a different animal and I like it. And it seems to be very high quality. It roasted well. And this is very enjoyable. So I'll have a link down below to Annette Muldrayer's book. I'll have a link down below for Lens Coffee and this particular item. And I don't remember price or I would say so. I just put it on the screen. 
So this is very interesting for home roasters to uh, play with. I'm dying to do a really light roast and a darker roast and see what happens. So I definitely recommend this for explorers who are looking for new flavors. So the second topic today is Arabica versus Robusta. And if you search that topic, you will find all sorts of little charts and articles and explanations around the internet describing all the characteristics and what makes Arabica better and what makes Robusta inferior. And only a very small number of those sources will come to some other conclusion. Oh, I'm sipping on a little Jameson cold brew, which might show up in a future episode. So I think most of those charts are really out there to point out the inferiority of Robusta. And it does have that reputation. It's something to be avoided. It's something you don't want to see in your blend or go near. The fault or the error in those sorts of explanations or analyses are that they're all talking about averages and generalizations. And that certainly doesn't apply in every case. The kinds of tastings that I'm doing and the recommendations I give are really because I'm tasting the top 10 or 20% of Arabica. I don't think I'm that close to tasting the average Arabica that's out on the commodity market. I think I'm tasting things that get a little higher price and selling into the specialty markets. So that's really the place we want to go when we're tasting our uh, Robusta into the specialty market. And that's what I brought out today was a specialty Robusta. Hopefully that's in the top 10 or 20% of all Robustas because it tasted good, it had good notes. I wouldn't give it any defects or fine flaws in it. I think that's in the top 10 or 20%, but I haven't tasted the whole range of Robustas. I haven't tasted the whole range of Arabicas. So I'm just sort of guessing after tasting 50 or 60 different coffees. The averages issue or generalizations Here's another way to state it. It is a well-established fact that fully half of all the Arabica grown anywhere in the world is below average. And the same thing applies to Robusta. Half of it is kind of crappy and no one wants to drink that stuff. Well, that applies to Arabica and Robusta both. That's what a specialty market is. It's finding the good stuff that they can provide year after year, mostly, hopefully. And that's better than stuff you just want to blend in, you know, put into blends. Blend doesn't really have any characteristics necessarily, special characteristics to uh, savor. Also, stuff that's not in the charts is probably a bit of 20th century history that explains some of the, you know, cause some of the regions to have the coffee profiles that they have now, or the growing, you know, the species profiles growing in their areas. I think there was a Brazilian frost in 1954 that wiped out a bunch of trees and caused General Foods, who was a big multinational company and in charge of Maxwell House coffee back then, before I was born even, it's that old. Uh, they needed to start adding Robusta because all of a sudden they weren't going to be getting from South America. So look at the years after World War II. A lot of Europe is destroyed and uh, the Americans are finally able to focus on, you know, setting up families and uh, buying a house and doing some of the things they were maybe wanting to do during the war before the war started. And... There was a booming consumer market in the U.S. for all kinds of consumables. Another sip. Wow, it tastes good like coffee. Hmm. So all the extra demand and then the Brazilian freeze and uh, thing after thing after thing meant there was a lot more robusta going into uh, all sorts of parts of Southeast Asia parts of Africa, parts of Central America and South America. 
That part of the history means Robusta is not really growing in the best coffee growing parts of the world. It wound up in some of the uh, you know, second choice or third choice or fourth choice areas. So a lot of the uh, Robusta characteristics are driven by the biology. So I'll have a chart down here below that I sort of adapted from I, mostly the Coffee Obsession book has a good chart that uh, describes most things. But I found it's a really good article which is a very balanced review and uh, understands all those things that we're talking about. And I, there's a couple other articles that are not quite as balanced, but I will link to all these things down below. And you can go read them yourself if you want to. If you're as big of a coffee geek as I am, you might want to. So I adapted the uh, charts that I found and kind of squished them all together on the important points I thought were important. So I just want to point out that maybe I haven't said it or you don't know that uh, these are two different species of coffee plant that we're talking about. So Arabica is Coffea Arabica and Robusta is Coffea canifora or canifora. I don't know how these Latin things are pronounced. I'm a scientist, but I'm not a biologist. And then the root systems have some differences that lead to uh, differences in how they're planted, cultivated, and grown. The deep roots of Arabica can find water even when the top layer is dry. But uh, Robusta has shallow roots. So you can, yeah, you know, the deep roots of Arabica let you squish the plants closer together. These are uh, coffee trees or bushes, but you can start out at five feet apart for the Arabica coffee plants. And, but uh, Robusta has a shallow root system and it takes a more rain, more frequent rain because they don't, their roots don't go deep. They won't find water in the dry periods. So they need a lot of rain. And then the flowering behavior is a little bit different. Arabica is generally in regions that have distinct wet seasons, and that makes the flowering more predictable and the harvest more predictable. You can tell when it's coming up. But uh, Robusta ends up in places with less stable climates. They don't have distinct wet seasons as much. It's harder to predict. It's more hit or miss. When it's going to happen, you don't know always. And it's just iffier. It's harder to plan everything. It's <laughs> as hard as farming is. Planting is a, a luxury, right? And then uh, the flowering to cherry period, the flowering to harvest. Arabica has a pretty standard nine month time frame for the growth from the flowering to the harvest time. It's more predictable, it's more set, it's more stable. It lets you plan and then you get another three months of the year to do extra stuff that you need to do on your farm. The maintenance, the pruning, the fertilization, moving things around is done in that uh, one-fourth of the year that's left to you. But Robusta takes 10 to 11 months to get ready to harvest. The flowering to the cherry time, 10 to 11 months, it varies from place to place, but it leaves you less time afterwards to do that pruning and fertilization and the robusta trees grow bigger they might be 10 meters tall they are tall there they need some pruning and you have less time to do that the harvest is less intense with robusta the harvest time because it's spread out but then your other things that you do around the farm more intense so that's the difference uh, the temperature preferences so i'm seeing 60 to 80 f for arabica while a Robusta likes 70 to 85 degrees F. And you can see the Celsius temperatures on the chart. But Arabica prefers cooler temperatures, cooler climates. So they end up going up the side of a mountain. So, well, let's go back a step. They all want a certain amount of daylight hours to be able to grow. So that sticks them all around the equator. They're not very far from the equator no matter where in the world they grow, Eastern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere, north of it, south of it. There's a pretty much of a coffee band, a coffee zone around the equator. And then the temperature preferences mean you have to go up in elevation to find the best Arabica growing areas. So that's why lots of things come from a mile high. It is not unusual to see things from five, 6,000 feet. And some of the best things come from those places. But the temperature preference for Robusta means you can 
grow it on, a, on an island somewhere that doesn't really have any highlands or mountains. You can grow it at sea level. And it doesn't complain. It just doesn't taste as good, maybe. So and that's so that's the altitude part of the chart. Is it has to go up to get that cooler temperature if it's Arabica and Robusta can grow down near sea level. So that's the biology part and the plant's behavior part of the charts that I find. Then this is exciting for me because I'm a chemist. Here's the chemical and physical composition differences between Arabica and Robusta. There's a big difference in the sugar content, which obviously is going to affect the taste. How many times have I said, oh, this is sweet. There's a sweetness. What is it? It's fruity. It's uh, brown sugar. It's something is sweet in this thing. I didn't over roast it. I didn't go to a real dark extreme and cook all the sugars. And I'm tasting sweetness in this. Well, Arabica is six to nine percent sugar. I don't know exactly what kinds of sugars they are, but I've been tasting them for sure. But Robusta tends to be between three and seven percent sugar, so it is definitely gonna most of it's gonna register as a little less sweet than Arabica. Well, guess how that affects people's preferences? People tend to go for the sweeter things. And then the oil contents is a similar story. Arabica is averaging between 15 to 17 percent oils that uh, affect mouthfeel and maybe the taste. I don't know if the oils are flavor components, but they certainly uh, contribute to mouthfeel in an aqueous mixture like the, well, not this one, but real coffee. And Robusta is only 10 to 12 percent oils, so that mouthfeel goes away and whatever flavor it contributes, there's less of it. So that affects the sensory experience, let's say, if it's not all taste. Next thing is caffeine content. Well, lots of growers and blenders like the fact that Robusta has twice the caffeine of the Arabica, but caffeine molecule is not a great tasting thing. And Arabica, let's, if you zero in on one number, it might be 1.2, 1, 1% 1 caffeine, while Robusta is more like 7, 2.7. So there's a range for each of these, but let's say 1.2 to 2.7, over twice the amount of caffeine in the Robusta. And caffeine is not a good tasting thing. It's a bitter alkaloid type molecule that people will go, you know, if you double the amount of caffeine in something and then had people eat it, taste it, drink it, you go, oh, this, where'd that bitterness come from? So that's one of the contributors to the taste difference. I don't drink a lot of Jameson things, but this one's good. Next is chlorogenic acids content, or CGA. Oh, oh man, this one's hard to explain. I had to do a little research on this to find out what the chlorogenic acids are. They're not like acids that, uh, you know, eat through steel and uh, dissolve things, but they're phyto compounds plants make. They're... I had to look up an article. Oh, this is, this is nerdy. I had to look up this article and these people isolated 69 different chlorogenic acids and they're all very closely related in structure. I can put a couple up on the screen, but there's like three pages of these structures. These are different structures, three or four across all the way down the page. And then there's another page and another page and another page and they isolated all these different compounds. So they list all the names, they give them little abbreviations or suggested abbreviations so that people can talk about them in other literature and chemistry papers. And there's a bunch and they are important because they probably have health benefits. Scientists have found that they have different benefits regarding uh, the regulation of blood sugar, basically, let's say that. So you get some of these chlorogenic acids in you and it helps, it's good. Your body works better. So these are shown here in this table as 5.5 to 8% in Arabica, but there's more in Robusta. 7 to 10% are chlorogenic acids. So that's a lot of one class of compound, one class of beneficial compound most likely, 
that's in these coffee beans that everyone reveres and and trades for all around the world so CGA content is one of the features and then the bean morphology and let's see I'll probably just steal one of the pictures in this article here this is a good one I'll just put it on the screen or show you on these so some of these arabica beans have kind of a crooked squiggly line going across yeah none of, very few of these are straight crooked oh you can't even see that one anyway arabica is crooked robusta is more straight across so i hope they don't mind that i stole the picture so all those biology differences and chemical differences lead to people having preferences for arabica over and over and over again and not for robusta okay this article okay i don't know when it's from 2009 june of 2009 probably in the atlantic oh that's a real magazine here's the here's the author as i write this the futures market for robusta is 70 cents per pound while arabica is trading at a dollar 14 per pound Actual delivery prices for both species range from much lower for the lowest grades of Robusta to more than $10 per pound for small lots of very special Arabica. This was 11 years ago. I'm certain that good horticultural practices and dedicated growers could produce better quality Robusta, but I would be surprised to find any with flavor comparable to good Arabica. So that's a coffee geek writing 11 years ago. And giving examples of the prices. Now, he was saying that Robusta could go a lot less than 71 cents a pound. Yeah, let's say expectations are low for all these different reasons. So the whole supply chain of coffee in the world has significantly devalued Robusta. So in a situation like this, someone's got to be the first one to say, I'm going to make it better and try to get more for it. So if someone's got to step out of their comfort zone or do something slightly illogical economically, short term, in order to get some kind of longer term benefit, someone's got to be a risk taker. You only have to be one point of that supply chain to and upgrade your level of performance or upgrade some sensory characteristic and people will probably notice, but you got to have other parts of the supply chain afterwards uh, agree that the change is significant or value it more in some way. So from all the articles that I'm reading here, people started seeing specialty Robusta push its way into the market in various places around the world, maybe around 2010. And it's been pushing harder and harder ever since. So that, I mean, it sounds a lot like maybe the whiskey boom or the cocktail boom or eh, craft beer is too old for all that. But other things, you know, cigar boom, people were looking for sensory experiences 10 years ago, plus or minus, and start, you know, they were looking for them everywhere. So maybe it was fed by part of that. So I got, was able to find this specialty Robusta that I reviewed today from India. Uh, episode coming up shortly, I'm going to compare a specialty Arabica with a specialty Robusta grown in the same place pretty much in Vietnam. So that'll be an interesting comparison. Don't be afraid of Robusta. Be afraid of average Robusta and be afraid of average Arabica. Look for those specialty items and learn how to read a label and figure out that this is not just some run-of-the-mill coffee, but that they've done something to it. They've grown it in a place that's interesting or they actually care about what they're making and have been able to move it along the supply chain to get this stuff to you. So that's my conclusion is that uh, Robusca is not something to be feared. It's just something to be studied. Learn more. Learn how you can find specialty Arabicas and specialty Robustas where you are in, in your market and how to get how to get the most out of them. 
So again, if you like the videos, please give this video a thumbs up, like it, and leave a comment, and leave a question. And subscribe to the channel, and click that bell to get notified when the new videos come out on Mondays, usually. Unlike today. So, cheers. So good, so deep, so dark, so rich.